Good evening and a very warm welcome here to the Cathedral for this, the first of our sessions during this just begun season of Lent. We're very glad you're here and are sharing this uh, together. I'm going to get out of the way the, um, the couple of bits of business at the start. My name is Edward Probert. I'm the Canon Chancellor here, and I am currently the uh, interim or acting dean, our dean being away on sabbatical leave. And um, if you have a mobile phone or similar, anything that could make a noise, please ensure it's off. And in the unlikely event that we have to evacuate the cathedral, don't pay attention to me, pay attention to people like Chris over here wearing the sashes, take direction from them. That won't happen. If there isn't a miracle, this will be an election year. And this series of Monday evenings is unashamedly and consciously political. But it's also unashamedly not hustings. And no one will be soliciting your votes in the course of this, or I will be very surprised if they do. Uh, Lent this season is a chance to be reflective and we're lucky so far that we do not know the date of this year's election. So we can be genuinely reflective and beyond the bounds of actual hustings, however political the background is at the moment. So we're going to reflect together on a number of key issues. And we're going to do this together as a Christian community. Whatever anyone's political views or voting intentions may be, we're on a shared journey through Lent. And these five sessions will be led by five different speakers representing different dimensions of the Christian community here in Salisbury. One little word about what will happen after this session and on the other sessions. We will decamp, or rather you are welcome to decamp, into the choir which is directly behind me, the part of the cathedral which faces inwards, where after a short pause we will conclude the evening with the short evening service of Compline. On other evenings, but not on this one, but some of the other evenings, there will be a choir, our cathedral chamber choir, leading the singing at that. But the other evenings, as this evening, will be spoken. This evening's speaker, I'm delighted to welcome and to introduce to you. The Reverend Dr. Mark Cheatham is the Superintendent Minister of the Methodist Circuit here in Salisbury. And he is the Minister now of Salisbury Methodist Church. And I will hand over with great pleasure to sit at his feet. Thank you, welcome Mark. Throughout history, humankind has created a multitude of different economic and social systems. Traditional systems, absolutism, feudalism, communism, capitalism, the list goes on. And while systems are complex, the truth is they were built by people, so they can be changed by people. After all, humanity is interdependent with one another and with the planet. The problem is, this is often forgotten, and short-term gains are prioritised over long-term value. Me over we, now over the future. Inequity over justice, profits over people and planet. 
leading to this and this. All of which are negative impacts of our current economic system. But it doesn't have to be this way. We can transform from profiting only the few to benefiting all, from concentrating wealth and power to ensuring equity, from extraction to regeneration, and from individualism to interdependence. It is not an unreachable ideal. It is the reality that we, the B Corp movement, are already building. Hello. It is good to see you this evening. Uh, as has been said, my name is Mark. My wife thinks it's hilarious because I apparently have dressed as I am on the photograph, uh, which was taken uh, best part of a year or so ago. But I thought I would stay in character and be recognizably, uh, recognizably myself. I stand here as one who um, has an interest in what's happening to our planet. I stand here as one who is fairly well educated and has served the church uh, for a number of years in different appointments. I don't stand here as an expert as such, but I hope that we learn together and that this evening and during this series, uh, we are all learners on a journey. Just a heads up for later, if you ask me a question, there's a 50-50 chance I'll be able to answer it, which means there's a chance I won't. Uh, but if you ask really helpful questions, uh, if it is necessary to do so, we can take them away and maybe find other ways to respond in due course. According to the UN Secretary General, our planet is broken. Humanity is waging a suicidal war on nature. Recent reports have described the devastating impacts of climate change, the unprecedented loss of animal and plant species, the widespread pollution of land and ocean and atmosphere, the degradation of topsoil, and the list could continue. We are living in a time of crisis. In the last 30 years, the church has made attempts around the world to explore how to respond well to the crisis. One landmark event was 1994, an evangelical declaration on the care of creation uh, was written and embodied by many church leaders worldwide. It emphasized that the earth belongs to God and that humanity has been given the biblical creation mandate, worth holding on to those words for a moment, to look after it. The Declaration recognized the growing crisis in the whole kind of health of our creation, if you like. The Creator's concern for all creatures was named, and that in Christ, they affirmed there was yet hope for creation. I am challenged by the language that humanity has a creation mandate to look after it. A theology of creation is an important part of our Christian faith, of course, I would say that is the case. Two fundamental theological principles are important. God is creator of the whole cosmos, and God gives freely. Christians are called to be stewards of the gifts God has given us. 1 Peter 4, if you want to go and look it up later. The natural world is not portrayed by Scripture as gifted to us. Rather, God creates it along with us. Following on from that kind of brief train of thought, if you like, I am thankful that God did not lie down on the seventh day as the creation story goes, leaving nature to run itself or humans to do so on God's behalf. It is now commonly understood that we, human beings, and our behavior are irreversibly changing the climate. We are shifting the seasons. We are destroying habitats. We are polluting the oceans with non-degradable plastic, squandering irreplaceable resources, and accelerating mass extinction. 
The responsibility towards nature is entrusted to us in Genesis 1, if you want to go and read verses 26 through 28. And it's one we can exercise only insofar as we express God's image. That's in verse 26 of Genesis 1. It is only necessary to read one more chapter on from my point of view to be clear that God gave us no license to exploit the natural world for selfish greed. In Genesis 2, the words cultivate and guard are often in the translations that we have available to us. And then I am struck by how God then sets out moral boundaries using the fruits of nature. I need to remember to keep the clicker in my hand. <laughs> the outcome of the world's redemption is described in evocative language in Isaiah 11, where the wolf and the lamb will live together. The child plays with the poisonous snake and none hurts or destroys. A common destiny as well as a common origin is what binds us inseparably in a shared hope for the whole earth. Our use or our abuse of natural resources demonstrates whether we are partners in God's creative purpose for the whole of it or not. I suggest we need to lose our superiority complex about the non-human creation and embrace its gifts and its contribution alongside ourselves to God's purpose. We carry responsibility within creation and not simply for creation. There is a need to stop talking about this world as a place within which we are located at the centre. I was asked a few days ago by somebody who knew I was going to be here tonight, uh, if there was one thing, if I couldn't go and there was one thing I had to know about how we might respond to climate change, what would it be? And I think I said uh, the most important thing we might be able to do to fight climate change is to talk about it, hence the picture, to talk about it. Conservative, liberal, labour, other does a thermometer on the wall give a different answer depending on your political stance? It does not. But the thermometer might be telling you the planet is warming and that humans are responsible for this and that to fix this thing we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, for example, as soon as possible. One person I know, not here tonight, I don't think, but it is Jack, uh, one, person, um, one person that I know uh, said, I would rather cut off one of my limbs than give the government another excuse to talk to me about what I should do to affect climate change. Okay, that's one point of view. But equally saying, yes, it's a real problem, but no, I will do nothing to fix it. Well, what's that? I don't understand that either. So instead, we use phrases and arguments like, it's a natural cycle. It will come, it will go, it will come again. Turn on the TV, it seems to me like Pandit Hay says it's cold outside, where is global warming? Now then, politician B says for every scientist you can give me who talks about global warming, I can find one who doesn't think it's a real thing. But most people recognise the environmental crisis. As far back as October 2011, the Office for National Statistics discovered that 75% of people living in Britain at that moment agreed that the climate was changing. But I rarely hear people talk about it outside of organised meetings or particularly focused conversations. Talked about or not, the vicious cycle of climate change continues the planet warms, the heat waves get stronger, the heavy rain becomes more frequent, storms get more intense, scientists release yet another field report with all sorts of facts and figures in, and too often politicians push back even more strongly, giving other uh, appropriately sounding commentary or maybe myths or even facts sometimes. What can we do 
to break this vicious cycle. I do genuinely think that one of the things we can do is to talk about it and talk about it more. We can look to our community, we can look to society, we can look to elected leaders for leadership and wisdom, and then of course when you stop talking, uh, you must sometimes act. Anyone read Todd Balsinger? No? Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm glad somebody did. Have you read this book, Canoeing the Mountains? No. Okay, maybe. <laughs> it's a great book. Um, I have a doctorate in organizational leadership, and this is one of the texts that we use when we're critiquing people's dissertations sometimes. The book is largely about the story of Lewis and Clark, who lead a corps of discovery in the 19th century and their expedition is to follow the Missouri River, kind of from the east, if you like, to the Pacific. They have no understanding of what the land looks like, because unlike today, they just don't know. There is no reference point for them. The title of the book, uh, they canoe to, um, as far as they can go, they canoe the river. There are mountains looming in the distance and they come closer and they come closer and they come closer, but they keep canoeing. Bolsinger says it's like a bunch of folks who go, uh, I don't know, uh, river rafting, and they come face to face with a set of mountains that are bigger than their imagination could fathom, but they keep canoeing. It is not going to do you any good to paddle harder when what you are faced with is a mountain and no water. The story in the book speaks of how they have to make an adaptation. The key to adaptation for many people is about going back to your deepest core value. For Lewis and Clark, they are men of the Enlightenment, and at the moment when they realize their mission is likely to fail, there is no water route to the Pacific Ocean, they do not stop. They get out of their canoes, they burn them for firewood, and they carry on. They have this deeper value that a growth of human knowledge leads to a growth in human happiness and well-being. The more important than discovering the water route to the Pacific Ocean is the discovery of a new world and a new way of being in it. That moment of crisis for them took, this, took them back to their kind of deepest value. I think the same is true for us. We are in a moment of crisis. What is your deepest value? There is a reason for the journey in the book to continue. There is a reason for us to continue. It is worthy of giving our lives for, I suggest. But if you lose your deepest core identity, then you stop having something to offer the world. There is something about the way in which God wants to be made real in the world that we can embrace, all of us. It will motivate us. It will teach us how to go through the painful process of learning and dealing with loss. A reporter apparently once said to Bolsinger, when he turned up to give a talk, there must be a lot of really disappointed canoeists out there, don't you think, when they've got part way through your book, my friend? Bolsinger said, I can't tell you how many places I have been to, and I have got up to talk, and there's been a canoe put on the display somewhere behind me. Look, we got you a canoe because you were coming. And I walk over and I say to them, he says, these things are beautiful. Somebody has built this. It is wonderful, but it is worthless when you run out of water. Letting go is one of our challenges, I think. How do we stop being expert canoeists? How do we become learners who will work with new kinds of experts to learn new ways and seek new collaborations to keep moving forward with the challenge set before us? What can we do to break this vicious cycle? One of the most important things we can do, I think, 
is to talk about it. The climate emergency already adversely affects millions of people and will increasingly affect us all over the coming decades. As Christians, we are called to proclaim the good news, to preach the gospel to all people. Yet the Bible doesn't seem to say anything directly about climate change. So what are you to do? You might take a two-stage approach. You might find it helpful. First, identify the key themes that comprise the gospel and then work out how to apply them. Since the Reformation, Western Protestants have tended to assume that the gospel is about personal salvation. But there are many other aspects of the gospel that are as relevant to the current emergency as they are personal salvation. Some of these are truth. Truth generally used as a shorthand to uh, explain whatever has been revealed to us through scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, what John Wesley would perhaps uh, be ascribed as knowing as the Wesleyan quadrilateral, but that's actually thanks to an American theologian called Outler about 60 years ago. Wesley never actually uh, said it himself. Sorry. If you read Wesley's sermons, there is a fifth element to his preaching and that is always creation. We need to extend this to incorporate our source of revelation, this idea of truth. Acknowledge what scientists are saying and engage well with it. Justice and love. A commitment to justice calls us to question a world order in which the most vulnerable and those with the least responsibility for climate change are those often most affected by our lifestyles both now and previously. This is about keeping love of our neighbour at the heart of how we live. Goodness and sufficiency, spelt with an H at the end. In the first book of Genesis, God looks at creation and recognises that it is good. Irrespective of your understanding of the creation story, the truth is God looks and it is proclaimed that he says it's good. As Christians, we are called to proclaim the inherent goodness of the natural world and to cherish it. Our gospel must offer a vision for all people living within the finite but sufficient resource that is available in this fragile planet. Relating to God, when all is not well, when so many people are struggling, we need to explore ways of finding that language of lament because the world is not as God intended. Our gospel might need to offer people a language to express their despair for whatever is happening as well as their thankfulness for the blessings received even in the midst of the chaos. Prophecy and protest. Biblical prophecy, the art and practice of speaking truth to power. We need a theology of prophecy and protest, a guide to the individual Christian to advocate powerfully for a different way of life. Biblical repentance and transformation. This requires not only an admission of our sinfulness, but a determination to turn away from it. Any gospel for our current world must offer a, a model of living that allows us to escape the lifestyles that have led us to this point. It needs examples of Christians who are willing to transform their living so that others might learn. Mission. Climate emergency offers us many, many opportunities for mission, but not necessarily as the church has traditionally conceived it. Hope. We are called to both live in hope and offer this to the world. Since the 1850s, anybody remember those days? No? That's a relief. Since the 1850s, climate scientists have used the language of science and climate change after discovering that if you dig up the coal and the gas, 
and you burn it and the oil, it produces heat trapping gases that wrap an extra blanket around the planet. But we told them, not us, but we told them they were wrong. Social science has taught us that if people have built their identity on rejecting a certain set of facts, then arguing over those facts is equivalent to a personal attack. It causes them to dig in deeper rather than build a way forward. So an argument is not the way to go. I'm not a scientist. My language and my theory may be limited. So instead of starting with scientific facts, which aren't really in my head unless I spend time studying them, I start from the heart. I talk about why it matters to me that there is, has got to be a response to the environmental crisis. I talk from the heart and I look for shared values. Are you and I, some of us, both parents? Do we live in the same community? Have we both been flooded out recently? Do we enjoy the same activities? Do we care about economics and national political policy, whether they affect our lives seemingly or not? For me, one of the most profound ways I connect with people is through my faith. As a Christian, I believe that God created this planet we live on. I believe that we are to care for and love the least fortunate among us, those who are already suffering the impacts of poverty, hunger, disease, and more. If you don't know what values someone has, talk to them, get to know them, figure out what makes them tick, and then you might be able to connect the dots between the values they already have and why they would care about a changing climate. In the conversations I have, virtually everyone I speak to has the values they need to care about the changing climate. By talking with them, we both connect the dots. I care about climate change because I am a father. I live in England where water shortage becomes more common and stronger storms cause more damage. I care about the climate because it is a multiplying threat. It takes the issues of poverty and hunger, disease and lack of access to clean water and even political crises that lead to refugee crises. It takes all of those issues and others and makes it worse. An example about this connecting and values. I was listening to a podcast uh, about two weeks ago trying to get my head around what I might say and which way I might go. Um, this evening for you good folks. And as I listen to this podcast, there's a scientist called Catherine, I can't think of her surname. She was giving a talk, she said, at a Christian college several years ago. This is her illustration. And after the talk, a fellow scientist went up to her and said, I need some help. I've been trying really hard to get my foot in the door of our local churches, but I can't seem to get any traction. But I want to talk to them about climate change. What can I do? So the speaker, Catherine, said, well, the best thing you can do is start with the denomination you are part of because you share the most values with those people. What church do you attend? No, I don't attend any church. I am an atheist, uh, this man said. The speaker said, well, in that case, starting with a faith community is not the way to go. Let's talk about what you do enjoy doing what you are involved in and what groups you are part of, and then we'll start with that, shall we, instead. To interact with the debate on climate change, to act in response to climate emergency, you need, I think, to allow yourself to be yourself. Because no matter where you are or where you live, climate change is already affecting you. Some parts of the world more extremely maybe than us. If you lived in North America, Australia, other parts of the world, uh, wildfires that ravage the countryside would be quite common. 
If you lived in the coastal areas around the Gulf of Mexico and some areas around the Pacific Basin, you would get stronger hurricanes and typhoons and cyclones, powered by the warming ocean, of course. If you lived in central-ish, north-central Africa, you would see deforestation and you would end up getting desert desertification. And if you look on any good map, you'll find the Sahara and underneath it you'll find the Sahel, which is a growing desert caused largely, people think, uh, by climate change. Climate change is driving the drought, it's making the drought more frequent, more severe. Wherever we live, we are being affected by the changing climate. In 2011, Sir John Houghton wrote a paper entitled Global Warming, Climate Change and Sustainability in which he drew attention to the effects of climate change. He included environmental migration. Since then, the UN's predictions of this increased to 200 million or more climate refugees by 2050. 200 million or more climate refugees by 2050. And he expanded with drivers for this migration including record-breaking climate change events, such as the expanding of deserts, the coastal flooding in places like Bangladesh, he referenced at the time, extreme heat and humidity making parts of India effectively uninhabitable, all kinds of environmental migration monitored by the UN, the impact devastating and tragic. According to the UN's humanitarian office, people living in developing countries are at least four times more likely to be displaced by extreme weather events than those living in more developed countries. The pressure to migrate to developed countries with more temperate climates is growing significantly. It's a challenge for us to respond to. Meanwhile, our work of catching up still has a long way to go because it requires a heart shift for lots of people, requires a change in values. Many of those leaving those stressful places of this world will grieve over the loss of their home, will be disorientated by the change that comes with moving, not by choice, to a new country. So you might say, okay, that sounds like a place to start. Let's talk about the impacts. We can scare the pants off people, that will get the message through. Because it's a serious thing, isn't it? But I suggest fear is not going to motivate us for the long term. Fear does not sustain the change we need to fix this thing. Neither can we plan for a future based on the past. I love this. If you're driving down the road and you're looking in a rearview mirror in most parts of the world, you'll see a beautiful straight road kinking out behind you. And it's very clear and it's very obvious where you have come from and the direction you are going. It is straight, it is straightforward, it is simple. The climate emergency tells us we can no longer think like that. The road is disrupted. It is not straight. There are bends and twists and turns we cannot see, and they demand our attention lest we crash. One thing that we need to help fix this is hope. Embodied in our shared values and our actions, recognizing what's at stake, but also seeking a vision for a better future. Motivated by that vision for the future, we can make and adopt climate-friendly habits. Not because they are going to change the whole world in one foul swoop at all, but because it enables you, each of you, to be consistent with your values. And it gives you joy when that is the case. New habits might then be formed, like reducing the the meat consumption that you maybe enjoy, if that's your thing, given that animal agriculture produces a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and contributes to deforestation and biodiversity loss. Or you reduce your food waste, which accounts for more emissions uh, nationally than the entire airline industry. That one took me by surprise. 
Or you can do other things which are maybe simpler. You can cut your energy bill by finding solutions. LED lights, insulation, turn down the thermostat a few degrees, install a heat pump, get your energy from a green supplier, and other solutions are frequently available in all sorts of places. The point here is we need a better vision for the future. We need a vision for a better future as well. A future with abundant energy, with stable economies, with resources available to all, where our lives are not worse, but better than they are today. There are solutions, and that's why the second important thing that we have to talk about is solutions, practical, viable, accessible solutions. You probably know those hotel rooms, those who go away from time to time, where you need to put a card in when you walk through the door to get the lights and the refrigerator and everything else to work. And you take the card out when you leave because you need it to get back into the room, and everything goes off. Wouldn't it be interesting to think if our homes work that way? You leave and everything goes off except the fridge, the freezer, and, and the security system, maybe. Lifestyle choices offer solutions. Eating locally, reducing food waste, uh, which at a global scale is one of the most important things we can do. Thinking about my carbon footprint means to the annoyance of one or two in this very place. Lots of our meetings remain on Zoom because it is the best use of our time, our resources, and stops us driving all over the countryside. Many of those things can be worked out if we talk together about what's already happening around the world, what might happen in the future, and share, shape our shared vision based on our common values. Simple statement, polar bear and iceberg. I wonder what you see when you see the polar bear on the iceberg. Do you see an award-winning photograph recently awarded in the last week or two? Do you see the polar bear as a mascot for climate change? This particular image and images like it do me a disservice because it makes for me the climate emergency distant and remote. It's a polar bear on an iceberg. I am neither that nor am I there. But if I think about it and I then talk to people about it, because I said that to somebody uh, about a month ago when we were talking about something else, I said, yeah, but it'll affect you eventually, won't it, Mark? When I thought about it after that conversation, yes, actually, that might be me. I might be sleeping on a place that has no future at some point. Ed very kindly mentioned at Salisbury Methodist Church where I'm the lead minister. Um, uh, when Reverend Kenneth was putting us together to talk about this, he said, maybe you'll say something about SMC briefly, Salisbury Methodist Church. And I'll be brief, but there are a couple of things that's worth saying about SMC. To reach better efficiency and reduce its carbon footprint and work that helped it get an Eco Silver Award and it's going for gold shortly, one of the first things it did, of course, was replace those inefficient filament light bulbs with LED lighting panels. And that reduced energy, energy consumption by about 90%, so I'm told. SMC's energy has been greened for some time with the early installation of 36, you can kind of see them, 36 um, solar panels uh, across the south-facing roof of the hall. The favourable feed-in tariff at the time meant we sold it all back to the, to the grid because it was cheaper, uh, more cost-effective to sell it back to the grid and buy it in cheaper. That's no longer the case. So for the present solar generation, any extension means we have to create storage options and solutions for those solar panels. And the recent church council agreed the purchase of batteries to store the energy. We've replaced our old boilers, 30 or so years old boilers, with a 100 kilowatt power rating gas um, condensing boiler, which is over 90% efficient. 
The offer is improved by the installation of one air source heat pump. And if your eyesight is really good, you'll see there are two pipes hanging off the wall. That's for a second air source heat pump uh, at some point. And as a circuit, a group of churches from Amesbury, shortly to include Shaftesbury and Tisbury and Mockham, uh, over to Winterslow and down to Fordingbridge, Sandal Heath, Woodfalls, that kind of area. As a circuit, our meeting in March coming up will receive an eco-policy which commits us to investing in all our viable buildings, essentially making them as carbon neutral and as sustainable as we can manage with the funds we have and the challenges of some of our beautiful spaces. But what about those who don't have the resources we have? Around the world, there are clever solutions. Social impact investors, nonprofits, and corporations are going in and using uh, innovative new microfinancing schemes to uh, create pay as you go solar use. You can use an app on your phone in many parts of Africa and you can get pay as you go solar energy. It's great. What about the growing economies of China and India? Well, they know that uh, clean energy is essential to powering their future, however we portray them in the media. So China is investing hundreds of billions of dollars in cleaner energy. They are flooding their coal mines. They are floating solar panels on the surface of the water. They are still burning coal, of course they are. It is what it is. But they have shut down a large number of coal, plant, coal mines, particularly around the larger cities, so that health can be improved and there is some impact on the environment, obviously. In India, I am told that they're looking to replace a quarter of a billion incandescent light bulbs with LEDs. They'll save several billion dollars from the cost, uh, the energy cost saving there. India is investing in green jobs. They're looking to decarbonize their entire vehicle fleet. India may be the first country to industrialize without relying primarily on fossil fuel. We'll see but it may be the first country to industrialize without relying primarily on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, phase down or phase out? UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez stated before COP28, we cannot address the climate catastrophe without tackling its root cause, fossil fuel dependence. COP28 must send a clear signal that the fossil fuel age is out of gas, that its end is inevitable. He then called for the phasing out of fossil fuels. The resulting text that came out uh, spoke of accelerating action in this critical decade. That reflects the urgency of our situation. Pledges to a new loss and damage fund at COP28 reached nearly $800 million, 60 million pounds of which came from the UK. It's a great start, but I suspect it's nowhere near enough, of course. So where does that leave me as I come to an end? I want to say we continue to engage in this crisis and the impacts of it because the world is changing. In the foundation of our conversation about the climate crisis is a unique understanding we have of hope. Why, you might say? Doesn't that seem too passive for such a pressing issue? But the short answer is we will not act if we think we have already lost. It is easy to focus on the negative and feel defeated especially when it seems that the negative is coming at us from every possible angle. But the good news is we can still make a difference. The future is in our hands. We can change things. When you are talking and when you are taking action, it is not simply for climate change, for an unknown person somewhere else. It is for you. It is for your family. It is for everything you love and everyone you love and every place that you love. That is why you are doing it, because it is your core value. There is a significant mind shift there 
if you are not already in that space. That is what our hope is based on, though, that core value and motivation of why you are doing it. And my hope is, as we go through this series with colleagues over the next few weeks, uh, we find language and ways to engage which help us speak well into the debates, not just about the political direction of our country, uh, but also the direction of this world and those brothers and sisters that we share this planet with. Thank you for, for listening so intently. One or two of you are making notes. I do thank you for listening so intently and hope that you at least have been able to draw something or a phrase or something you didn't know uh, from what I have said uh, this evening. Thank you.